Still. <laughs> Lift off. Yeah. Right, we are live. So welcome to this meeting of the cabinet held on the 7th of March. Apologies for absence, Liz. Thank you, Chairman. We have apologies from Councillor Parry and Jennings today. Mr Chairman, can I give notice that I'd like to say something under item 9, which would normally be taken as a non-block item? Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Remind me of that. Uh, disclosures of interest? Any disclosures? No. In that case, minutes, confirm and sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 7th of Feb. Are there any questions on the minutes? No. In that case, we move on to item four, notice of motion, competitive <coughs> bids and grants, uh, which is in the name of me. Do you want me to lead on this, David? Or do you want to? I, I can just say a few words if you want. Say a few words, Mr. So, so um, in response to the notice of motion, draft of the report as requested by the Cabinet in relation to the Council's current approach in relation to bidding for grants and, and um, laid out where over the uh, last three or four years we've either been successful or unsuccessful in securing grant funding. I will say one of, one of the omissions I noticed when I talked to this report at the OSC the other day was that I hadn't identified within the report actually the council's approach to um, how we go about the, 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 the bids. We tend to employ specialists in particular areas when we are making grants for particular um, grant opportunities which are available. So the, the person that we would employ for say the um, the leveling up bid wouldn't be the same kind of individual that we would employ for, for doing a bid under the decarbonisation fund, for instance. So I, I, I made that clarification to the OSC the other day. I also suggested that we as an authority aren't in the, the process of chasing every single grant opportunity that's available. It's that the grant opportunities which go towards supporting the council's aims and objectives are the ones that would be prioritised in in any um, any opportunity that we have. So. The, the report, as written up by an officer, doesn't give you a, rec a clear recommendation. It gives you options to consider under section two of the report to either reject not motion on notice on the basis that we are already effective in relation to bidding for government monies or accept the motion and on the basis that it is not effective um, or fully effective in the, 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 the bidding for, for government money. So I just wanted to make that clarification at the beginning. Thank you, Mr. Buckland. Um, I have a few points to make before I bring Councillor Junid in. First thing is, surprises as it may seem, I agree with a couple of comments in the notice of motion uh, about a fragmented funding landscape. I would wholly agree with that. Uh, risk that money does not go to where the need or opportunity is greatest. And the reality actually is there is a significant difference between need and opportunity, which does not seem to be totally recognised. And final sentence there, the challenges can be more severe where funds have short time scales for application and delivery. And that is absolutely true. And we've been caught out by that a number of times when the time scales for delivery are frighteningly short. So. There are some points in the Liberal Democrat notice of motion that I would agree with. Uh, moving on. Don't, don't look so surprised, Councillor Junit. I, I haven't finished yet. Uh, <laughs> if we look at the point 131, the Stratford Gateway project, and I just uh, make the point that we were in category two out of three categories, which actually meant um, it would have been very difficult for us to actually get funding. Um, and the categories were determined as to underlying economic need. And unfortunately, Stratford-on-Avon is considered a very prosperous district. So not exactly scoring terribly high on need, despite the fact that we'd suffered 
more than most, in fact, far more than most in the COVID pandemic. Uh, it is quite interesting when we got the feedback from the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, it was clear the project was a good strategic fit. It then went on to say the scheme itself at this stage was not in a position to be delivered immediately. Personally, I thought from the submission we made that rather blindingly obvious, given that we'd applied for the money to purchase the site and work up the scheme. However, and I would just stress that the scheme itself is very ambitious and will prob probably top out at 120 million or more to deliver the entire scheme, big scale. There's then a whole list that Mr. Buckland has put in where we have actually been successful, and there are an awful lot of them. Uh, it is just a point worth making about the future high street funds where we did submit the bid for Studley at that time, Stratford on Avon itself, Stratford up on Avon itself would not have qualified as the high street at that stage was not in the state it's in today. And it was very clear that bids would not be accepted for town centre areas that were not facing significant challenges. Uh, we are in a very different situation now. So the total funding we've secured amounts to 21.4 million. Uh, which actually is a very, very substantial figure given the scale of the District Council. My view is that this demonstrates that the policy we've adopted in terms of bidding for grants has actually worked well. And I am proposing that we reject the notice of motion on the basis that we are effective. I'd like to second that. Thank you. Um, may I just make the comment that a lot of the funding that has come forward uh, has been bid for by people in relation to housing. Um, they're very flight of foot and effective at applying for these things and various people stick a towel around their head and quickly um, fill in forms where we then raise 1.3 million pounds towards, for instance, lads. So those, so in house, we have a lot of expertise in various departments already at applying for bids. And I'd like to congratulate them on that. Actually, that what we actually do do manage to do in house without getting anybody in extra. Thank you, Councillor Barker. Councillor Cargill. Thank you. The first is a, well, you may not be able to answer it, but uh, Mr. Buckland, <clears throat> the first question is, why are the timescales for these grant applications so short? I mean, I just don't understand it. Uh, it is very frustrating and it's across the piece. We, we get it in, at all levels. The second one is that have we uh, a strategy in place to put in oven ready schemes so that if grant funding does become available, then we are able to respond quickly? Mr. Sorry, Chairman, through you. Uh, yeah, I guess you'd have to ask government why they put in such tight timescales sometimes, Mark. I think it's to get a policy objective away nationally at, at local level. And if there are oven baking, oven baked, oven ready schemes, then, then of course they can see to be introducing their policy really quite quickly. <sighs> I mean, we, we don't always get the insight into the government's thinking in advance, so I think it would be difficult, pardon me, I'm still losing my voice, for us to have a complete um, spectrum of projects ready. But as I explained earlier, if the project that we are looking to fund is already part of our key priorities as an authority, then that certainly would, 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 would do it for me. Uh, we've been very successful recently in relation to some of the climate change grants and I know um, Dave Barber, I don't want to steal his funder, but has got a, another success in the bag as well that's going to help the two authorities. That's an excellent example of where it's a key council priority. There's a government scheme available, we can bid for that and, and, and then we can get that money away to support our functions. But if it was not part of what we really wanted to achieve as a council, then it, it would be become 
a strategy of chasing funding and I, I wouldn't suggest that that's what we're about and, and to be fair we had a good debate about that particular issue at, at the OSC the, the other day. Thank you Mr Buckland. Councillor Jernard yeah, and yeah, Councillor um, Kettle. The, the OSC was referred to and um, it, the, the, these were, this was explored quite um, in depth because the, the, orig the um, original motion um, was to see explore if if uh, Stratford District Council had a sufficiently resilient and robust robust strategy um, to um, to react to the way that government is doing this bidding, which is, is has actually been criticised not only by the National Audit Office but by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, the LGA, and a whole host of other um, organisations about the piecemeal and and the uh, the short termism. Um, but could I just um, just go on to say that the, the 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 ones that you have won do illustrate very very much the importance of working in partnerships. Um, because quite a lot of these, particularly all the S SHDF and LADS schemes, are, are worked with Orbit uh, or with Act on Energy um, in putting those bids together. And they, you know, it's very, very important that partnerships, you know, that working in partnerships is part of that strategy. Could I just do one? if you don't mind, ask a question, because I've looked up the Housing Infrastructure Fund Marginal Viability one, which is put 13.4, is down as May 2020. That was actually awarded in 2018, four years ago. Um, so perhaps that needs um, that needs to be uh, corrected. It may be only now being, being applied, but the actual bid was awarded in 2018, I believe. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's when the bid was, was submitted. It took a long time to put in place a legal agreement surrounding the bid, and therefore it, it was a long time before the actual bid was then formally secured. So although we had the indicative award in 2018, it was some time after that, that we actually got the legal agreements in place to allow Carla to start drawing that monies down. And, and I'd say we've, we've, we've only just finished drawing that, that funding down in the first quarter of this year. So it, it, it has only just come to fruition. Because I, I, I do know that you ha it was on the website as as winning the win it in 2018. <laughs> Susan, I, I had I had completely underestimated at that time the the amount that we'd have to put into the legal agreement to actually get it across the line. And that was a a big big task. Can I just clarify, Mr. Buckland, was this the one where something almost had to be couriered to Edinburgh to meet the deadlines? <laughs> Yeah, there, there, there was a lot of stresses involved, a lot of um, additional legal support that we had to get, especially around um, it was issues about state aid and, and land values. That, that was a big, big sticking point on that particular agreement. I should just say that that was no reflection on the council, but it just does illustrate the sheer complexity and difficulty of some of these things. Councillor Kettle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I mean, this is this is a great track record. Um, but one thing I suspect is that all this information was publicly available, either on our website or, or in other areas. And I just wondered how much officer time could have been saved if the research had been done before the um, no motion was raised. Could, I, could, I, just clarify, could I clarify that I did all the research and apart from the um, that one that I've just mentioned, the others were not available, not clearly. Councillor O'Donnell. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's actually just to echo what Councillor Barker has said about how, you know, flight of foot people have to do these grant applications. We discussed it at length at OSC and I think we just left with a greater sense of admiration for the officers filling in quite impossible timescales sometimes. Um, and that our feeling was, do they have enough support and is the system robust enough to meet the demands and in no way criticising what they're doing because the results speak for themselves and it's a very tricky system to navigate. So. I think it kind of turned the, no the notion around a little bit that, you know, what else can we do to help them? Thank you, Councillor O'Donnell, Councillor Pemberton, and then Councillor Harvey. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Judith makes a, a good point, and that is indeed part of the strategy, is around the partnership working. Um, and we have long taken the approach that in the grand scheme of things, we are a relatively small rural district council 
and that our best strategy in securing any objective, whether that be through funding or through an app, is generally speaking to partner with others who can help us deliver. Um, so that is absolutely part and parcel of the strategy. It is also part and parcel of the strategy to focus our efforts on, as the chief executive says, um, schemes and the projects first in terms of their fit for our corporate objectives, their fit for the needs of our residents. Um, because uh, to, to do anything other than that, given the myriad of various different funding streams and partnership opportunities, um, uh, as, a, as a former boss of mine once says, you end up trying to boil the ocean. Um, you have to be really targeted about how and when you go after these things. And that leads us to have uh, a strategy whereby we have key officers and those officers are then supported by re resources that when it is appropriate and adds value, uh, outside resources are brought in to be deployed to support bids. Um, and that ties in with that focused approach rather than, for example, um, a putting a list of projects together and just seeing you know whether something comes along and fits that and or b um, additional officer resource focused on actually what is just one part of the process which is the bid writing itself um, and the the marginal viability fund there was a lot of external resource brought to bear um, none of which could have been provided by one individual with one particular skill set so I think um, the message here is that we are taking um, a strategic approach. We are taking a, um, a sort of nuanced approach and we are uh, we are reasonably successful and there's and it is at this point, given those two approaches, um, difficult to see where we could potentially um, amend that approach and achieve a significantly different outcome at this point. The officers have got access to resource and they've got the support of a cabinet that will um, make room and time and space for those things. Um, on that basis, whilst uh, I think I share, as does probably everybody in this room, uh, the frustration of short time scales, um, a less than strategic approach to uh, funding from central government and that has that has afflicted central government of all all colors and persuasions um, on that basis i'd be uh, supportive of the notion that we re reject uh, the motion as presented um, on the basis uh, and i was just looking for it is uh, where are we just coming down to there it's just yeah um yeah, that we, uh, we 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 reject the motion. Uh, so thank you, that Councillor. is where I'm at uh, for this particular item. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Councillor Pemberton. And I'll have Councillor Harvey and Councillor Shenton, and that means every member of cabinet has now spoken. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor Curtis for uh, submitting this motion because it's enabled the officers to produce a report which illustrates the good news of how successful they have been in over the past four years also, uh, to put that into context, it will not have uh, escaped your notice that in relation to paper uh, item six on the agenda, that the amount of money raised over the last four years is roughly equivalent to the capital expenditure for a whole year uh, this council intends to make. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to go along uh, with the, the recommendation to, to reject this. But in saying so, uh, to make a point to Councillor Junid, we are at one on this, that what we want to do is to make sure that given the the, um, the the flaws and, and frustrations in the system as it is, that we succeed as best we can and the record shows that we do. But all I'd say to the officers is that if circumstances change and you need to come up with different answers and different level of resources in order to continue to win bids, then I would urge you not to be sh um, churlish at coming forward and asking for resources as and when required. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. I have to say, uh, I have not noticed the officers being slow in coming forward. <laughs> Councillor Shenton. Thank you, Lisa. Um, it was just to illustrate a, a couple of other uh, 
ways or, or instances where we have had partnership working. One uh, is with the lottery fund over lottery funding for trees, and that was with Witchhaven, Heart of England, WDC, uh, uh, as well as ourselves in partnership there. We're still awaiting the decision on that, um, but we worked very closely together and acted very quickly to get our, our uh, case together. And the other one is on the UK one, UKA 100, which is the, I, I spoke about this last week, about the training for Paris champions on uh, climate change, which we have uh, won that. We, we again, we acted very quickly. Um, we acted with WDC on that one. And uh, uh, we, we, so when the opportunities, especially on climate change come up, we will move fairly quickly as, as fast as we can to get them. The, but notwithstanding that, um, some of the comments on on competitive bidding and and the, the problems with uh, for short the shortness of time on on funds that manifests itself very going to manifest itself very clearly in the build back greener program where the government have announced lots of different initiatives absolutely no detail on it and you can imagine that all of a sudden these will be rolled out and it'll be a short period of time and. Uh, we will be up against up against it, trying to compete for multiple funds. However, I believe one or two other issues have got in the way at the moment, so that might be delayed a little bit, obviously. But thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Councillor Shenton. So uh, I've had the notice of uh, motion on notice. Uh, we recommend that we reject the motion on notice. Uh, that's been proposed and seconded. Can I have your agreement, please, members of cabinet? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, members of cabinet. So moving on, plant life. Councillor Shenton. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, in principle, I agree with this. Um, I have no, no, no problem with it. I think as, as everyone here is likely to as well, I have no problem with it. But where I, I have a, a slight um, reluctance to go with uh, saying let's let's decide it today is that the county decide the verge policy. They have an emerging verges policy which was due on the 1st of April, but I've not seen the final draft of that. And talking to Julie Lewis um, earlier on today, she hasn't been consulted properly on that yet. So that's an emerging policy. Now that will have an effect because we only will only do what the county tell us to do because they have to fund it. Um, as far as open spaces go, well, uh, again, on that score, we have uh, ID Verdi, who we use, and we've just extended that contract for one year. And so any changes to that will obviously have some costs. So what I am what I'm saying, I suppose, in short here is that I support that the, the, like the, the, the idea of the motion is great, but I think we should defer to a short report when we know what the county's Verges policy is um, in maybe a couple of months time and uh, restrict the report though to half a page or a page, a very short report on it. Can I just be clear, Councillor Shenton, you are saying that there is still some uncertainty around, so the report may not come for two or three months? Yeah, I think because the, 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 county, the county haven't uh, sorted out that. Uh, what was due on the 1st of April that hasn't been sorted and we need to understand what the costs are likely to be. So I think if we can go for option B, I would feel more comfortable on this. I just want to be absolutely clear on the expectations. Councillor Barker, then Councillor Junid. Um, I'd just like to make the point, wearing both my hats at the same time as a county councillor, that if we are waiting for a report um, and what uh, and an emerging policy that's coming from county. I really think we should wait until that's come because not only is it county's responsibility and county pays for it, it's not ours. And I know I love wildflowers. I love what we, you know, there's all sorts of things we could do, but because it's being done by someone else, I, I don't think we should be doing it twice. 
councillor barker councillor junid um, yeah uh, when when you're talking to anybody could you draw attention to the fact that plant life has done um, a considerable amount of research on road verge uh, management guidance guidelines and, and open space um, giving four options of, of different options that are of different levels of, of commitment um, they really they are, have done a lot of work on it and uh, it would be it would be helpful if um, if you know I'm sure that they probably are already aware of those management guidelines uh, but uh, they are they are in depth. Councillor Shenton. Yeah, just just to come back on, on that, um, uh, Heather Timms is the person who heads up that, um, and uh, she met a, uh, a a delegation of myself and a group of, of you might say activists, but people who are very interested in the biodiversity uh, agenda, and she was well aware of, of of plant life and had seen the the video. So yeah, they are well aware. I have the draft, but the draft. Uh, it could have changed dramatically, so I'm not even going to put it in front of everyone. So I think delay it, uh, as Councillor Barker said, uh, and leaders, our uh, leader says, for a couple of months. I think that would be the best option there. So you've proposed uh, option B, defer consideration of the motion to await a report at an appropriate moment. Councillor Barker, did you second that? As long as we use the report that um, County provides maybe with a very short opinion from us on it. Yes, a very okay. short report. In that case, in that case, um, members of cabinet, can I have your support for option B, defer consideration of the motion? Great, thank you. So moving on, capital budget monitoring periods one to 10, Councillor Harvey. Um, Thank you, Mr Chairman. <clears throat> May I begin by apologising for the omission of Appendices 1 and 2 from the papers distributed for this meeting. Uh, this was due to an administrative error rather than any more sinister reason than that. Both Appendices have now been laid on the table. The purpose of this paper is to keep members informed of the progress made over the first 10 months of the year in undertaking the Council's intended level of capital expenditure this year. Table 2 on page 20 demonstrates the intention now to undertake expenditure of up to £21.7 million pounds this year, including Section 106 projects. Whilst the amended capital expenditure budget has remained unchanged since the last report in January, further capital expenditure of £881,000 has been spent or allocated since the end of period eight. The current position for the year to date as a whole is attributable in very large measure to the decisions to enter into the new waste disposal contract with BIFA and to fund improvements of the equipment within the district's leisure centres. If all the Council's budgeted exp capital expenditure as reported in Table 1 on page 19, that is £21.7 million, pounds, were to be delivered, the Council's remaining accumulated capital receipts and grants to the end of January 2022 would have been reduced from £5.7 million pounds to £2.9 million. Pounds. Paragraph 1.4 indicates that capital expenditure of £7.4 million pounds has already been undertaken by the end of January. In the first 10 months of this year, therefore, the sums spent or committed amount to 34.2% of this year's available budget. Appendix 2 provides summary information concerning the various projects yet to be funded through Section 106 agreements, totalling £7.6 million, and those where Section 106 funds have been committed of £1.2 million. Appendix 2 also shows that just under £1.1 million of community infrastructure levy funds have now been committed to various projects around the district in Ulster, Meehan Vale, Shipston and Stratford. I ask therefore, Mr Chairman, that the current position on capital expenditure and income for the period to the end of January 2022 be received. Councillor Junid. Just, just a couple of points, if I might. Um, number one, it is not really to do with um, your budget, but I, I, it's just a suggestion, which is on table two, uh, it, you do um, say something about the Crooks Lane play area. Uh, I wonder whether I have thanked offices in the past. Oh, sorry. My apologies. 
Uh, my apologies for that. Um, I wonder whether you could um, uh, somebody thank, uh, although I'm chair of all youth projects, I'm not the only member. There are other four other members of the public um, that uh, helped raise that money. I'm just wondering whether somebody could actually thank them for raising that money um, through various bids that they put in, uh, 25,000 to help the district council by match funding. Uh, it's just a suggestion. Uh, and but my other question is of the um, uncommitted funds held by Stratford District Council. Um, just when will what, what's the commitment to actually get, have that money spent? Because uh, I, I noticed, for example, that one of the ones were Bellway Homes, South Midlands. It was paid in 2017 and it should be spent within seven years. Is there a sort of, you know, uh, uh, is there an overview of making sure that those are those sums are spent properly and on time? I'll defer to, to Mr Buckland, but I do know the answer to that question is yes, that one of the things the staff that administer 106 and Sill Money are, in fact, perhaps their, their biggest backstop is they must not send money back so that they know what the timescales are. Uh, I think it, 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 if it's ever happened, it's rare, extremely rare that that's happened. But Mr. Buston will no doubt fill in. It, it, it is rare. It's not unprecedented. We have unfortunately had to repay monies in the past and when we repay monies it's not just the money it's the interest that that goes alongside that so you're, you're right our management team your management team sorry um regularly receives update reports in relation to the outstanding section 106 uh, contributions that we have and the spend date absolutely is reviewed to try and ensure that we as far as possible can get get projects away Mr. Pitt, uh, um, it might just be helpful to add on the occasions where we have had to return money, it tends to be because the, the agreements were drafted in such a way that there wasn't a project to which we could allocate, allocate the money, particularly in terms of affordable housing, where it had to be spent in a very specific area and there were no schemes forthcoming that, to put the funding to. So we have tried over the years to address that by being more flexible in the way we've drafted agreements in the first instance, if that's reassurance to members. Councillor Barker. I was just going to say HIP is uh, one of the methods by which we deal with this, the Housing Investment Panel, um, where we look at any projects that come forward, largely that are affordable, um, to do that. But uh, but I agree that the um, what controls how how money is spent now is a lot, lot looser than it was, thank, looser in a good way, thankfully. Councillor Kettle. Um, it's really just a point arising out of the, the paper that uh, was circulated today with the details of Section 106 committee monies. Um, and that is on two pages, there are 12 projects um, which are affordable housing to be fund, uh, fund, well, funded off site affordable housing. And if you go through that list, there are one or two consistent names coming up of uh, developers who are would appear to be uncomfortable with putting affordable housing on their own site and if it is one or two or it's a small site you know a, a, a 10 or 11 site uh sorry house site then it might be 